Assalamu alaikum and hello everyone. Welcome to this channel by me, Mog. In this video, we are going to talk about chest pain. By the end of this video, I hope you can share some feedbacks in the comment section below. If you like the concept of this presentation, perhaps I'll make this into a new series where we explore the differential diagnosis of a chief complaint commonly presented in clinical setting. Any constructive criticism is highly appreciated. We are going to explore chest pain in this format. First, we will talk about its causes, the different types of chest pain, the supporting history such as associated symptoms and risk factors, and suggestive signs on physical examination. Lastly, diagnostic investigation. We will revise some basic pathophysiology along the way when needed to strengthen our understanding. My references for this topic are as follows. Let us begin. We can divide the causes of chest pain into two major groups, the life-threatening ones and the non-life-threatening. Two major groups of chest pain, which are life-threatening, are due to problems in the cardiovascular and respiratory system. Let's put the others into the third group. Differentials of chest pain from cardiovascular system are coronary artery disease, aortic dissection, pericarditis, and pulmonary embolism. Although pulmonary embolism are categorically belong to cardiovascular system, but the consequences of this disease, that is pulmonary infarction, will manifest into symptoms and signs that belong to the respiratory system, as we will see later. From respiratory, we have spontaneous pneumothorax and pneumonia. Other less common causes include mediastinitis and esophageal rupture. For non-life-threatening causes, I have selected three systems in particular, gastrointestinal system, musculoskeletal, and psychological. We have gastroesophageal reflux disease, costochondritis, and da Costa syndrome. So there are a lot of differentials to begin with. We are going to talk about all of them except pneumonia, because I think it is best we do this topic along with other diseases associated with shortness of breath, because this is the primary complaint, and mediastinitis and esophageal rupture, because these are less common. Alright, now let's elaborate each type of chest pain according to each causes. Chest pain due to coronary artery disease is called angina. There are three characteristics that define angina according to Parvin Kumar and Michael Clark. The pain is retrosternal, radiates to the arm, neck or to the jaw. It is provoked by exertions, male anger or excitement, and is relieved with rest or glycerol trinitrate. All these components describe classical angina. Lacking in any of these can be atypical angina or non-angina. Coronary artery disease can be divided into stable angina, acute coronary syndrome, or Prince Metal's angina. Chest pain in stable angina occurs only during physical exertion, and it lasts around 3 to 5 minutes on average, whereas for both acute coronary syndrome and Prince Metal angina, the onset of pain occur at rest. This is because in stable angina, there is a stable atherosclerotic plug that causes chronic progressive narrowing. This narrowing still allows blood to the heart, and the amount of blood going to the heart is sufficient for its function. Angina will manifest when there is increased oxygen demand, for example, and physical exertion, where the heart needs to pump more blood to the body. In acute coronary syndrome, however, there is a sudden cut of blood supply due to the ulcerated atherosclerotic plug. This will block the much distant, narrower vessel. This complete block causes symptoms to manifest even at rest. In Prince metal angina, there is sudden cut of blood supply as well, but due to spasm of the blood vessel. Acute coronary syndrome can be further divided into more specific diagnosis, that is unstable angina or myocardial infarction. Clinically, manifestation of chest pain in unstable angina is suggested by the following. There is deterioration of angina from previous symptom seen in a stable angina. This deterioration can be seen in terms of increased intensity of angina pain, frequency and duration of attack, and these occur at rest. For example, a month ago, John Doe experienced chest pain while jogging which lasts for 5 minutes, relief with rest. But today, he experienced a different kind of angina, this time while he was resting. The duration lasts for 10 minutes with more severe pain. He took the previously prescribed GTN so the pain is relieved. That may suggest acute coronary syndrome, specifically unstable angina. For myocardial infarction, 
any severe chest pain that lasts more than 20 minutes can suggest myocardial infarction. Let's say if John Doe has no GTN with him and had to suffer for, say, 40 minutes, by that time, infarction may have already occurred. In aortic dissection, the pain is also retrosternal because that is where our aorta is located. It is sudden in onset and severe pain. It may radiate to the back in between the scapula and it is tearing in nature. Whereas in angina just now, we have gripping, constricting or crushing pain. In pericarditis, there is also retrosternal pain. However, the pain changes with different position. It is aggravated with lying flat and relief with sitting upright or leaning forward because in this position, there is less pressure on the parietal pericardium. In respiratory disorders, they share similar features of pain, commonly described as pleuritic pain because irritation of the parietal pleura causes this pain. It is described as sharp, knife-like pain tends to be persistent. The pain is aggravated by deep inspiration, sneezing or coughing because these further stretch the pleura. It is well localized and non-radiating. Pulmonary embolism can cause retrosternal pain if major large vessel is obstructed. This pain is different from that of pleuritic pain because it is originated from the pulmonary vessel. But when pulmonary infarction occurs, the pleuritic pain is localized to the site where the portion of the lung is infarcted either at the right or left side. As seen in this picture, we can have large embolus occluding major vessel or smaller ones occluding much distant vessels at the periphery. If smaller vessels are affected, we may have this wedge-shaped pulmonary infarction. Since this is embolus, it must be originated from somewhere. Most commonly, it comes from deep vein thrombosis that get dislodged and travel through the inferior vena cava into the heart and into the pulmonary circulation. But pulmonary embolism may present alone without deep vein thrombosis symptoms. Spontaneous pneumothorax causes pleuritic pain at either right or left side of chest because at the apical and the periphery is where pleural blab or pleural bullae is commonly located. In gastroesophageal reflux disease, the pain is also retrosternal but burning in nature because this pain is caused by gastric acids irritating the esophageal wall. It is precipitated by bending over or lying flat because at this position, the gastric acid easily reflux into the esophagus. Next is costochondritis. The chest pain here is only mild to moderate in terms of severity and it is usually localized to either side of the chest. It is also sharp in nature, aggravated by deep breathing, cough or sneezing but not because of pleura, rather these movements stretches the costochondral ligament as the chest expands. There is a specific functional syndrome called the Costa syndrome. Patient commonly complains chest pain in the left submammary region that is non-radiating, sharp and stabbing in nature, which lasts from hours to days. It is aggravated by emotional tension or tiredness. Other causes of functional pain include panic attack and Munchausen syndrome. Alright, now that we have elaborated the different kinds of chest pain, let's dive into other supporting histories such as associated symptoms to the presenting complaints and their risk factors. Other symptoms that support angina are dyspnea, nausea, vomiting and diaphoresis of sweating. This is made due to vagal stimulation because the heart is also innervated by vagus nerve. It is also important to note that absence of angina does not exclude coronary artery disease because some patients may present differently. Features supporting atypical kind of vagina are unexplained fatigue, sweating or dizziness. We must be aware of atypical angina especially in those who are diabetic, obese and in elderly. The risk factors for coronary artery disease that you may want to acquire can be divided into three. The non-modifiable risk, modifiable risk and risk which are disease related. Non-modifiable risks, for example, are family history of coronary artery disease, history of premature or sudden death in family. Modifiable risks are more related to patient social history, such as smoking, sedentary lifestyle, high-fat diet and alcohol consumption. Disease that contributes to coronary artery disease are hypertension, diabetes mellitus, hyperlipidemia, and any already established vascular disease, such as peripheral vascular disease or stroke. You may also want to quickly screen for symptoms of cardiac failure. Remember that although 
Acute coronary syndrome is an acute event. It is the culminating result of long-standing chronic disease such as hypertension, diabetes mellitus, and others that forms the atherosclerotic plug. So by the time patient has acute coronary syndrome, he or she may already have developed symptoms of cardiac failure beforehand. But it may also be a direct consequence of the recent coronary artery disease. In that case, acute cardiac failure. Examples of symptoms suggestive of cardiac failure are orthopnea, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, reduced effort tolerance, and lower limb swelling. Symptoms associated with aortic dissection are many. Among them are syncope and limb weakness. It actually depends on where the blood in false lumen impinges the branching vessels. If it impinges the posterior intercostal vessels, as shown here, it may cause limb weakness because these vessels supply the spinal cord. If it impinges higher up, for example in between the left common carotid and left subclavian, patient may have syncope because now less blood goes to the brain. Aortic dissection commonly occur in elderly. Hypertension is one of the most common associated risks, almost in 80% of cases. In much younger patients, this can occur in patients with connective tissue disease such as Marfan syndrome because their vascular walls are more fragile compared to normal. But these diseases are not known to many laymen, unlike hypertension, so acquiring this from history taking may not be fruitful if he or she is previously undiagnosed. We may perhaps discover more during physical examination. In pericarditis, chest pain may be the only symptom, and it is commonly caused by recent myocardial infarction, which is also known as stressless syndrome. Other causes are uremic pericarditis, seen in chronic kidney disease, autoimmune disease such as SLE, and viral infections such as Coxsackie or Ecovirus. In that case, patient may also have recent history of viral-like illness or symptoms. In pulmonary embolism, if the embolus are large enough that it occludes a large pulmonary artery, less blood will return to the heart and into the systemic circulation. In that case, patient may also have syncope or presyncopal symptoms. Symptoms that suggest pulmonary infarction are dyspnea and hemoptysis. If the pulmonary embolus is originated from thrombosis of the deep vein, the chest pain may be preceded by history of unilateral leg pain or swelling. Risk factors that contribute to formation of thrombus are long hours of immobility such as international flights or history of bed bound due to recent major surgery. Some malignancy also can cause hypercoagulable state. In spontaneous pneumothorax, chest pain is associated with dyspnea. Risk factor for this disease are long-standing chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, old tuberculosis, any connective tissue disease or asthma. For non-life-threatening disease, GERD is associated with episodes of water brush. These occur when the acid reflux not only into the esophagus but up to the oral cavity. Costochondritis may due to recent history of exercise of URTI. Da Costa syndrome may be accompanied by anxiety symptoms resembling panic attack with or without depressive symptoms. Alright, next we will look into the suggestive signs for each disease from physical examination. For coronary artery disease, there is really no signs that specifically pointing to this diagnosis. However, we can look for suggestive signs that show this patient may have the risk to develop this disease. For example, we have tar staining at the fingers among smoker, tendon xanthoma and xanthelasma for familial hyperlipidemia. Arcosinalis also suggests hyperlipidemia, and lastly, obesity. Then, we may also want to screen for signs that suggest cardiac failure as well because of the reason we have stated earlier. Generally, patient may be tachycardic, jaundice due to hepatic congestion, has elevated JVP, narrow pulse pressure due to poor cardiac output, and sacral and pedal edema. In cardiovascular examination, patient may have displaced a packed speed with gallop rhythm due to cardiomegaly. Pulmonary edema will cause bibasal fine crepitation in respiratory system examination and in abdominal examination. Patient may have hepatomegaly due to hepatic congestion and ascites. In aortic dissection, if the dissection occur before the aorta branch into left subclavian artery, patient may show different blood pressure for right and left arm when we compare the two. The compressed vessel will show hypotension. 
Comparing the two radial pulses from each upper limb will show radio radial delay. But if the dissection occur after the left subclavian artery, we will have radio femoral delay instead. In young patients, we may also want to look quickly for features suggestive of Marfan syndrome, such as Steinberg sign, Walker sign, long arm span to height ratio, pectus carinatum, or high arch palate, among others. Aortic dissection, if located near to the root of aorta, may also cause aortic valve regurgitation. In that case, we will find mid diastolic murmur at second left intercostal space and collapsing pulse. The only specific sign for pericarditis is pericardial friction rub, although admittedly, this is very difficult to be appreciated. It is described according to Nicholas and O'Connor as either biphasic or triphasic sound occurring with each heartbeat. To differentiate these with pleural rub, if we ask patient to stop breathing for a while, pericardial friction rub would not diminish because the heart continues to pump. But in pleural rub, the sound will stop because the friction is due to movement of the lung. This is best heard at lower left sternal edge when patient is leaning forward. Pericarditis can lead to pericardial effusion. In this case, the sound of the pericardial rub would diminish. The heart sound also will be muffled by the effusion and a dullness below the angle of scapula will be detected on percussion. This is also known as the E-word sign. Pulmonary embolism, if massive, will cause hypotension, elevated JVP, right ventricular heave and tricuspid regurgitation. This is because less blood returned to the heart from pulmonary circulation, thus poor cardiac output. And this embolus causes backward pressure, hence elevation of JVP will be seen, right ventricular heave and tricuspid regurgitation may be heard as well. However, the earliest sign for pulmonary embolism can simply be tachycardia if there is only small vessel embolus. For pulmonary infarction, pleural rub is suggestive. In deep vein thrombosis, palpation of the cuff will reveal tenderness. Tall, young, slender male are recognized as risk to develop spontaneous pneumothorax. At a glance, you can easily look for this feature before any close examination. In respiratory examination, features of pneumothorax include reduced chest expansion on the affected side, reduced tactile fremitus, hyperresonant on percussion, reduced both breath sound and vocal fremitus because air is relatively a poorer conductor for sound compared to solid. For reflux disease, there is no specific sign, but dental erosion may point to chronic consequence of water brush. Costochondritis is a clinical diagnosis. Tenderness will be elicited when the costochondral junction is palpated. There may be visible erythematous fusiform swelling as well. For Da Costa syndrome, there is no specific sign as well, but helpful features that we may want to look for are fidgeting, fast speech, speech that may suggest anxiety, or poor eye contact, slow speech, downturning corners of the mouth, and bowed posture that may suggest depression. The next and final step is diagnostic investigation. But remember, some diseases may not need special investigative equipment because history taking and physical examination should already guide you to 80 to 90% of diagnosis. Let us start again from the beginning, the coronary artery disease. The easiest non-invasive readily available investigative tool is the electrocardiogram. For stable angina, ECG findings are normal in between attacks. Ischemic changes such as ST depression and T-wave inversion may be seen when exercise tolerance tests or stress echo is done. In unstable angina, ECG may be normal or showing ST depression and T-wave inversion. Myocardial infarction can further be classified into non-ST elevation myocardial infarction and ST elevation myocardial infarction according to the ECG findings. The first showed ST depression and T-wave inversion whereas the later will have ST elevation with or without T-wave inversion. Prince metal angina will also show transient ST elevation with or without T-wave inversion. There is a lot to talk about in ECG. If you want to learn more about the ECG's changes in coronary artery disease, you can click at the pop-up at the top right corner of this video here. So diagnosis of ST elevation myocardial infarction is quite clear, but to differentiate unstable angina and non-ST elevation myocardial infarction, 
Other than presenting history, we also can do a blood test for cardiac biomarkers. We have troponin, creatine kinase, and CKMB. These biomarkers peak at different hours and last for different duration. All these may be done together or separately. More importantly, we have to know how to interpret the three of them. There are pros and cons for each test. For example, troponin lasts up to 14 days. However, troponin is raised in both myocardial infarction and ST depression unstable angina. So this does not differentiate the two. Creatine kinase is only raised in myocardial infarction, not in unstable angina. However, it is non-specific for cardiac muscle. Intramuscular injection, for example, can also raise creatine kinase because skeletal muscle also has this enzyme. The most specific biomarker for cardiac myocyte is the CKMB. To diagnose myocardial infarction, the level of CKMB must be more than 50% of the total creatine kinase. We have looked into ECG and cardiac biomarkers. The next useful investigative tool is the chest x-ray. However, this is to screen for features seen in cardiac failure rather than coronary artery disease itself. Cardiomegaly is seen in both compensated and decompensated cardiac failure. Features pertaining to decompensated cardiac failure follow the sequence below. First is dilation of the pulmonary artery, followed by upper lobe diversion. Next is interstitial edema seen as curly B lines, peribronchial coughings, bad wing signs, and lastly, blunted costophrenic angle. This is the example of x ray showing changes in cardiac failure. The fourth tool is cardiac echo. This can measure ejection fraction in cardiac failure. Pertaining to coronary artery disease, the infected wall will manifest as reduced wall motion in cardiac echo. This investigation also helps to exclude presence of mural thrombi. For aortic dissection, the three useful diagnostic investigations are chest X-ray, Doppler echo, and CT or MRI. Similar to ECG, chest X-ray is also a quick and non-invasive investigative tool. Chest X-ray in aortic dissection may show mediastinal widening that is a mediastinal width of more than 8 cm at the level of arch of aorta. Other features include distortion of the aortic knuckle. These, however, are non-specific to aortic dissection. Other causes of mediastinal widening include aortic aneurysm, lung atelectasis, mediastinal lymphadenopathy, or presence of any mediastinal mass. If patient is clinically unstable in emergency setting, we may want to choose Doppler echo over CT or MRI scan. The intimal dissected flap can be seen in Doppler echo. The use of color Doppler also allow identification of true and false lumen and detection of aortic branch occlusion if there is absent flow. Another advantage of Doppler echo, we can also use it to diagnose aortic regurgitation, which is a common consequence of aortic dissection. If patient is clinically stable, CT or MRI scan can be done. Aortic dissection is seen as biluminal aorta. This tool also helps to precisely point to the location of dissection. For pericarditis, ECG and chest X-ray are helpful as well. Pericarditis will show ST elevation and T-wave inversion similar to that of myocardial infarction. But to differentiate between these two from ECG point of view, the ST elevation and T-wave inversion in pericarditis tend to be diffuse, that is manifesting in all leads, and the ST elevation shape is usually downsloping or concave. This ST elevation also will not evolve into formation of Q-wave. But remember, pericarditis and myocardial infarction cannot be differentiated based on ECG alone. We have to take into account patient clinical presentation as well when forming our diagnosis. In pericardial effusion, it can be seen as decreased QRS amplitude or electrical alternance. To understand this, let's look at this comparison. On the left, we have pericarditis and pericardial effusion on the right. In pericardial effusion, we have this fluid surrounding the heart in the pericardial sac. So what this fluid will do is it will dampen any electrical conduction, putting a resistance to the traveling current. So the QRS height, which reflects the voltage or amplitude in all leads, will decrease because of this dampening effect. This is also the same reason why in pericardial effusion, 
we will hear muffled heart sound in cardiovascular examination. If there is large effusion, the heart will not stay still in motion because it is actively pumping blood. This will cause it to move around, bouncing in the pericardial sac with each heartbeat. And when that happens, the heart axis also appears to move around. So what we will have in the ECG is electrical alternance. Since the QRS reflect the vector of heart axis, its amplitude will change with each beat. So you will see tall QRS followed by small QRS, tall QRS again, and the cycle repeats in the same ECG leap. In chest X-ray, pericardial effusion is seen as globular heart shape. Next is pulmonary embolism. There are a lot of investigation for this, each with different diagnostic value. ECG is still useful. We also have serum D-dimer, CT pulmonary angiogram, and VQ scan. For ECG, the findings of pulmonary embolism is commonly associated with S1, Q3, and T3. But more importantly, we need to know that these findings are only seen in 10% of cases, and it is also a rather relatively late manifestation. The commonest and earliest manifestation of pulmonary embolism is actually sinus tachycardia. However, this is also non-specific. In case you are wondering what S1, Q3, T3 means, S stands for long S wave in lead 1, Q wave is seen in lead 3 instead of left lateral leads, and T wave inversion in the same lead. Next is serum D-dimer. This is not diagnostic for embolism because it is an inflammatory marker, so it can also raise in other cases involving inflammation or infection, etc. However, serum D-dimer has a good negative predictive value. So if serum D-dimer is not raised, then it is very unlikely that this patient has pulmonary embolism or deep vein thrombosis. Before we move to other invasive investigation, we perhaps want to do chest x-ray as well. This is useful to look for consequence of pulmonary embolism, that is pulmonary infarction, seen as wedge-shaped infarction or more commonly known as Hampton harm sign. Occlusive pulmonary embolism will also cause regional oligemia, that is, less opaque vascular markings seen distant to the site of occlusion. This is known as Westermark sign. Other non-invasive investigation is 3-point compression ultrasound. This is diagnostic enough to diagnose deep vein thrombosis but not pulmonary embolism. The hardened venous segment will not be compressible as it should because we know that vascular wall of vein is supposed to be more flexible compared to that of artery. For pulmonary embolism, the two investigations that has high diagnostic value is CT pulmonary angiogram and VQ scan. For VQ scan, it will show something like this. Next is pneumothorax. Use of X-ray for diagnosis of pneumothorax is sufficient. In fact, we can actually arrive to diagnosis by clinical examination alone. However, chest x-ray helps to rule out other underlying causes that may lead to pneumothorax, such as old tuberculosis. Pneumothorax is seen as visible pleural line with area devoid of vascular markings lateral to it. In tension pneumothorax, there will also be mediastinal shift. These pictures show the manifestation of pneumothorax in x-ray. Alright. Next is esophageal reflux disease. Usually the first step is to give a trial of proton pump inhibitor. This intervention is also considered having a diagnostic value. Because if patient responds positively with this medication, then he or she is good to go. The next investigation is rather invasive. That is why giving PPI is more convenient. It is also better in terms of cost benefit and better patient tolerance. If symptom does not improve, Endoscopy can help to diagnose esophageal reflux disease. However, a negative result does not rule out esophageal reflux disease because esophagitis, that is, the inflammation of the esophageal wall, is not a defining characteristic of GERD. It is only a part of the spectrum. We also have non-esophagitis reflux disease, which is another spectrum. This can be diagnosed with ambulatory monitoring of esophageal pH or esophageal manometry. Costochondritis is a clinical diagnosis, thus there is no need of specific diagnostic investigation. However, we may want to do ECG and chest x-ray to be safe to rule out life-threatening causes of chest pain. 
Likewise, this also applies to the Acosta syndrome. Since anxiety and depression is also part of the symptoms, we may want to conduct psychological assessment using Beck's anxiety or depression inventory. Before finishing off, it is also important to note that the causes of chest pain we have gone through are the common ones among adult age group. For children, your priority for differential diagnosis will be different. The following are the causes of chest pain in children taken from the reference textbook. Alright, that's it for this video. If it proves useful, hit the like button or share them with your fellow colleagues. Subscribe this channel for future videos. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye.